These days, a lot of American soldiers have been having their pictures taken at the ruins of the ancient Sumerian city of Ur in central Iraq. No one can now get to this site without a military escort. It is one of the oldest cities on Earth, and reputed to be the same Ur mentioned in the Bible as the home of Abraham. Since the mid-19th century, archaeologists have been digging here, uncovering and restoring the great mud-brick ziggurat. But the greatest treasures were to be found far below. And it was in the 1920s when Sir Leonard Woolley, sent by the British Museum and the University of Pennsylvania, uncovered the treasures of the burial chambers, which had been placed there some 4,500 years ago. Until January 15th, you can see at the St. Louis Art Museum why this is still considered one of the greatest archaeological finds ever. Treasures from the Royal Tombs of Ur is a traveling exhibit from the University of Pennsylvania, and it is one of those high-profile exhibitions that was both exciting for the museum to get and challenging to handle. It is a big production, and a lot of discussion, debate, and work went into finding just the right ways to present and protect these priceless, ancient, and sometimes fragile artifacts. These are always dark. Absolutely, yeah. Now, there's a reason for that. <laughs> Is it the drama, sure. Okay. Sure. Uh, and to draw your attention to this particular object. So right. this is the, this is one of the attendants who was buried with the uh, with the queen. And what always amazes me is that these people went to their death willingly. And, right. and quite a few of them. Well, in the queen's chamber, yes, yes, yeah. there were I think something like 50, 50 people. Right. Yeah. The challenge with some of this material is that we have lighting restrictions, so you can't just blast the objects with with all the light you want because there are organic materials like shell that uh, require restrictive lighting, so we can only go up to 20 or 30 um, uh, foot candles of, of uh, light, and that that's the real challenge. Is those instructions come those with instructions this come with the show, exactly. Right, exactly. so when we look up here, which of course, most people coming through, you, you're not asking them to look up at the lights. Well, we don't want them to. The, ob the object is for them to look at the show, uh, look, look at the object, and not be aware of uh, how the object is mounted. I mean, that too is an, an incredibly difficult uh, task, right. is to get the object mounted so that, th that the visitor is only looking at the object and not aware of how it's suspended or how it relates to the next object. That could be you know, hours and hours of work just to make them out so that the piece sits where it sits. One of my favorite objects is this gold bowl on the end, and I've, I've joked and pleaded and begged um, the, the folks at, at uh, Penn to be able to take that object out of this case because I think that people, I think people miss this bowl uh, because there are so many objects in there. But unfortunately, the, um, all of the mounts for everything in the show are travel with the show. They're all. Um, formed and all pressed into place so that when the case travels, the mounts are already there. So you, you have some choices of what you can do, but not, but you have to clear them. The with. choices are really in the objects that are just sitting on the deck, like mm -hmm. the, the gold chisels that you see over on the right hand side. There are no mounts involved there. One of the largest and most ornate objects and one of the really big stars of this show is Queen Puaba's headdress. It arrives at the museum in many pieces and has to be carefully assembled on a complex system of attachments. On this display, the St. Louis Museum staff feels it made a big improvement on presentation. What's underneath there is basically a flesh-colored football helmet or, or bicycle helmet on a flesh-colored broomstick. So we got permission to uh, fabricate this uh, drapery you couldn't see the earrings from the front. They were hidden. Then a lot more uh, movement of the drapery below right. uh, allowed us to, to sort of focus on the, on the earrings in front. And I know I'm not supposed to be focusing on it, but when you look at it, you see that there's an implied shape of a face. Uh, the back is, 
it gives you a sense of hair falling down. That's great. I'm, I'm pleased that that happens for you. I'm not sure that happens for everyone, but it's, it's an amazing... I, I hope people will spend time looking at the individual elements of this uh, headdress. It, it's just a phenomenal piece of jewelry. It's a little over the top. <laughs> in many ways, yes, in many ways. In the world of art and archaeology, Uri is as significant a find as was King Tut's tomb, even if today it is not as widely known among the public. Woolley first sent word of his discovery in a famous telegram he composed in Latin so that the news would not be intercepted and publicized before he was ready. Woolley was a talented archaeologist, not just good at finding things, but also at their removal and reconstruction. It is sometimes the smallest objects that are the most astonishing, and visitors are offered magnifying glasses to appreciate the craftsmanship. Remember, these are more than 4,000 years old. And this was from the king's grave, and obviously... Two of the most famous pieces are on display here. You may have seen their pictures in art history books. The large wire reconstructed around the original decorative bull's head and engraved plate and the remarkable ram caught in a thicket, one of two that Woolley found in the tombs. It's uh, absolutely thrilling to have this object here. I mean, it's an icon of, of Near Eastern art. It's one of the finest uh, objects of Near Eastern art ever produced. And, and this is the real thing. I mean, this is, this not, is the real thing. You know, one small piece and they've recreated the rest around. It. That is correct. That is correct. This is one of the objects found in the uh, in the Great Death Pit, and it is um, an absolutely fabulous object. It was actually a, a table support. I mean, it had a little, um, a little horizontal plat platform on the top of it, and there must have been some ash or something. Some sort of object was burned on the top, maybe incense. Not as ornate, but perhaps more personal, is the gold drinking straw. Apparently, ancient Sumerians liked to sit around with these and drink from a very large pot of beer. There is a lot to be found and examined and contemplated in this exhibit, and it's quite a trick for exhibit designers to gently lead you from treasure to treasure, so that each one can have its moment in a very carefully placed spotlight. In the end, you, as you walk through, uh, you, you happy with how it looks and how it feels and oh, how I'm, people are responding? Oh, I love the way it looks. I love the way it feels. I'm, I'm, this is, I love doing exhibitions at the St. Louis Art Museum because working with a group of people that do exhibitions is great fun. But each and one presents its different each one, challenges. Each one is absolutely a challenge. Each one is mind-bogglingly difficult, but um, the end result is fantastic.